Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Naomi Tedmore, and I'm the chair of the Social History Society, international UK-based learned society for the promotion of social history. And I'm delighted to open this plenary panel entitled National Myths in Times of Crisis. Obviously very topical. This event today crowns a fortnight of events which we've been holding in lieu of our regular conference. We had eight strands, 11 panels and a total of 436 participants. The strands replicate the usual strands which we have in our ordinary conference. All the events have been recorded and uh, before long they will appear online. You can already tune in and look at the prize giving uh, interview which I held with the winner of the Social History Society Book Prize, Professor Khaled Fahmi, and interviews with Kate Brooks, the winner of our graduate postgraduate exchange prize that was held with our communications officer, Dr. Henry Irving, and Chad McDonald was interviewed by Pam Cox, our former uh, chair, and he received the Public History Prize. So first of all, I'd like to express my deepest thanks to all those who came and participated and made these events happen. The conveners of the strands played a crucial role. Special thanks to our administrator, Ruth Byrne, to our honorary secretary, Georgina Bruce, treasurer, Jennifer Evans, and especially to uh, Henry Irving, who was our communications officer, as I said, and he really is uh, uh, the mover and shaker here and has made this uh, take place. So he will also take the chair after me and will continue to chair this event. We have two guests this afternoon. Joe Fox, Professor Joe Fox and Dr. David Coast. Joe is the director of the Institute of Historical Research at the University of London. She's also a professor of history at London University. And she specializes in the history of propaganda and psychological warfare in the 20th century, particularly in connection with Britain and Germany. She also has contributed a great deal to public engagement on those topics. David Coast is uh, lecturing at the University of Bath Spa, and he specializes in early modern social history especially in the circulation and interpretation of news and the relation that this has to politics. So we will start with Joe and then proceed to David. Each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll have questions. The usual uh, etiquette is that uh, we uh, post our questions during the time that the speakers speak, we post them uh, on the chat box and then Henry, who's going to take over from me, will collect the questions and will uh, take over when the question part and the discussion happens. So can I also remind everyone if you could please uh, keep your microphones muted and your um, cameras off and uh, we're ready to go. So Joe, I can see your face here online. Uh, thank you very much for uh, appearing here and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Naomi. I'm going to attempt to share my screen now, something I've not quite done before, so fingers crossed. Here we go. And I would like to play that from the beginning. There we are. Hopefully that, that's working. Um, 
Thank you ever so much for inviting me to speak today. I feel incredibly honoured to have been invited to participate and it's really exciting for me to talk about my own, my own research again. So I'll try to contain my excitement a little bit. I'm very sorry that we couldn't all be together in Lancaster to talk about social history in a much more uh, social environment. But I think it's an immense uh, achievement uh, of the Social History Society to have pulled all of this uh, together. Well, today I'll be reflecting on a problem that's been on my mind um, for some years, actually, and uh, one that I haven't entirely resolved or I don't really know what to do with. And for me, they're the most exciting uh, papers to give uh, in any case. About six or seven years ago, I was asked to write a chapter um, on propaganda during the Second World War for the Cambridge history of the Second World War. And I was searching for a key idea to pull the whole chapter together. And the editors told us, well, you need something, you know, quite dramatic, quite, quite different to pull it all together. And I started to think about a key problem for historians of propaganda, one that I hadn't really seen people write about very much. And that is, how long does propaganda last? And propaganda campaigns, as we know, are often created for a very specific and immediate purpose, although even just a, a glimpse around us at any one time demonstrates that the most powerful, the most resonant propaganda campaigns are rarely confined to their original historic purpose. And for me, that really opened up a whole series of questions. How long is a propagandistic moment? And why do some campaigns remain in our consciousness while others fade away? What makes for an enduring propaganda trope? And why are some campaigns unsuccessful in their own time, but hold some promise for a future moment? If those campaigns do reappear, how do they morph? How are they reimagined and to what end? And how indeed are they put to work in the present? And how then, what do we do with these propaganda objects when they go through that transformation? How do we interpret propagandistic objects with interconnected pasts and presents? And even how are they being used to construct some imaginary future? Undoubtedly, as, as Birgit Mersman and Alexandra Schneider observe of images, propaganda brings something with it, it passes something on, and it bequeaths something, but, but what? And those questions certainly resonate in reference to the propaganda of the Second World War, and that's what really struck me when taking stock of the propaganda of, of that period. And that's really where I concluded that essay for, for the Cambridge history. Propaganda seems to somehow remain at the heart of that process of inclusion, exclusion and elision that forms some part of our individual and collective memories, particularly those um, that define our national stories. And I'm, I'm interested in the fact that Quite often, certainly in the periods that, that I'm, I'm thinking about in the Second World War, those national stories are direct descendants of propagandistic campaigns. There are clear connections there. Now, it's only natural, of course, that war plays a defining role in the construction of, of national stories. And it's unsurprising that there's a connection to propaganda. Wartime is often when propaganda is at its most intense and its most ubiquitous. And as part of that longer term process, war propaganda, its key images, its slogans, its tropes, its sentiments, tend to become distilled down into a simple, recognisable, and for some, comforting and reassuring form. And one of the most pronounced aspects of any propaganda campaign in its own time, for me, and, and studied it over a, a reasonable period of time, the thing that strikes me the most is it's full of tensions both within the propaganda itself, um, especially when that propaganda is taken as a whole, and of course, between the propaganda and public react reactions to it. But what's really interesting to me is that over time, those tensions are eroded, they fall away, and they become blended into some a much more stable narrative, a much more coherent narrative that wasn't necessarily there in the first place. It wasn't there at the time when the propaganda campaign was origi originally launched. And those propagandistic 
images, texts, phrases, slogans, and the emotions that they evoke and provoke, then reappear um, when needed as a kind of anchor for an unsteady ship in a, in a stormy sea. They're remobilized at times of crisis. And I want to know, and I've got a feeling that this is right, but, but I'm not sure, but I, I think that in that process, the power of that original campaign is redoubled, it's thickened by, by new layers, and the meaning and resonance deepened by each reaffirmation of its basic tenets, its basic founding principles. Those propagandistic reimaginings, I think, are both at the same time familiar and nostalgic, although not obviously not universal, and not for all. They're a warning or they're prescient in some way, they're grounding and disruptive at the same time. So around this time, when I was thinking about this idea, as I started to collect examples of, um, of this, this process where propaganda of the Second World War, and then I started to collect the First World War too, but the propaganda of the Second World War in Britain started to pop up in all kinds of places. Now you can imagine I've been quite busy over the past, past few weeks since, since March, and it all came back to the fore, um, especially those ways in which the propaganda of the Second World War was really, and in a really direct and pronounced way, resurrected to rally the nation in, in the midst of the current pandemic. And I, I started to collect avidly. So I'm going to share with you a few examples that I've collected over the past few weeks as, as a means of demonstrating visually how these propaganda narratives reappear for different purposes. Now, of course, there was the inevitable comparison between Churchill and Johnson. And here and on, on the left, you can see two propagandistic images blended into one social media posting, um, simultaneously mobilizing the iconic image of Churchillian defiance with the design of the early modern, um, uh, the early um, Ministry of Information posters with that positioning of the crown um, that you can see in the example given on the right. That was the first poster. Um, designed by Waterfield in 1939. It was an absolute disaster at the time, but interestingly, that's become quite an iconic image that is remobilized uh, now. And of course, uh, the most memorable being the much debated and referenced keep calm and carry on. But that wasn't just in, in popular, um, that, that, those, those connections weren't just in popular postings. This one is interesting, official statements also carried the language of uh, Ministry of Information propaganda briefing documents in 1940. And anyone who's been through uh, the MOI policy papers in the National Archives will see not only a textual familiarity with, um, with a camp campaigns of the 1940s, but even the underlining, the capitalization, we will beat it, win the fight, this government will do whatever it takes. There are real connections, connections there. And all of those references, of course, were invested with added poignancy by the fact that the 75th anniversary of D-Day fell right in the middle of the crisis. We All Meet Again became the lockdown anthem, um, sending Vera Lynn, Dame Vera Lynn with Catherine Jenkins to number one in the charts in early April. And of course, the World War II vet veteran, Captain Tom Moore, occupied that number one position again with his version of You'll Never Walk Alone with Michael Ball. The commemoration of V-Day on the BBC culminated with a version of We'll Meet Again sung by frontline workers. And um, the intervention of the Queen, of course, through her message to the nation, not only invoked that wartime spirit through image and word, but connected in direct ways to memories of her father's radio addresses to the nation throughout the war years, again at times of crisis and her call to the national spirit and compassion for those, quote, feeling a sense, painful sense of separation from their loved ones drew directly on those wartime reference points. And if that were not evidence enough, the Queen reassured us that, quote, we'll meet again. As with the propaganda of the war years itself, reassurances from above were supplemented by commitments to national resilience from the population as a whole. And that example there from the uh, evening Glasgow Times, we'll live through rationing, we'll get through this. And of course, um, in a strange repetition of um, contemporary public scepticism of the Blitz spirit, the reimagined campaigns of now challenge subversive uh, behaviors, those that push against the communal spirit 
and encouraging social sanction and condemnation of acts that run counter to the notion of, of community all being in it together. And of course, in the early days of the coronavirus, that centered on hoarding and panic buying. And the blitz spirit hashtag was used to point to profiteering. This is a good example from social media, the hashtag blitz spirit. This was for um, toilet rolls being sold for £11.20. <laughs> so pointing to, to profiteering, exposing those seeking to make a quick financial win from a national crisis. But also, and I had to share this one, it's a bit indulgent, but I, I enjoyed this quite a lot, but using iconic images from the war as a vehicle uh, for, boosting, uh, for boosting dose of humour. This was my favourite of those examples, partly because that image in itself and what it's really showing is, is contested. Now, they're just a, a few uh, examples, but what we're seeing now is, is not at all new. And the use of this imagery is quite common at times of crisis. So I've, I just want to use one more example to show exactly how these mobilisers are really very powerful. Um, and I'm really interested to hear of other examples in, in discussion. But, and that's the response to the bombings, 7-7 bombings. Uh, the editorial of the Mirror of the 8th of July um, repeatedly used the propaganda phrase, and it was really stark too, made famous by Humphrey Jennings and Harry Watt's iconic Blitz short film of 1940, London Can Take It. It was a title changed to Britain Can Take It for, for the US market, but the Mirror um, used, used both together. The editorial, interestingly, referenced specific sequences from Jennings' film to capture Britain's hardiness. Quote, let us send out the message that they famously hung on the front of a de destroyed shop front in London of the Blitz, business as normal. Three little words that said, up yours, Adolf. We will mourn our dead and we will grieve for our families and innocent lives that have been shattered forever, but we will carry on, business as usual. London can take it, the British can take it. Now that was not only evoked in the mirror, but across national media, and you can see some of the front covers, the Churchillian sort of languages, we never surrender, we'll never be defeated. Um, the star's use uh, of, the, of the word um, blitz, blitz London, to make that connection. But also the choice of the, the iconic um, image of the bombed out London bus that lingers in Britain's cultural memory of the aerial tax on the capital. The Express went for sort of business as usual, common to wartime shops and again featured in London can take it, together with a whole bunch of stereotypes drawn straight from wartime propaganda. Quote, those three little words, its editorial stated, summed up that rare quality of formidable strength that Londoners, be they wise cracking cockneys or smoothies from Chelsea, managed to sum them up, summon up when they're threatened, as they were yesterday. The Independent went uh, further still, and they um, quoted from Noel Coward's song, London Pride, in full in their editorial for its theme, quoting the lyrics, London Pride has been handed down to us, London Pride is a flower that's free. Now, for me, the debate here is not whether these comparisons are meaningful or helpful. That's a topic of another uh, paper entirely, but rather why we turn to these powerful propaganda constructs uh, in, at times of need and what is it precisely carried forward and why. And what I'm really interested in is they are, they all, they all begin life as propaganda constructs, but as they travel into this new, um, new world, this new future, we've forgotten that that's where they started their lives. And that process is interesting to me. I'm also interested in what elements have been lifted out for, from the original campaigns and how those elements are then tailored to fit the circumstance. For example, the focus on rationing of food hoarding in the early days of COVID, the, the London focus for 7-7, and then fascinatingly, why do we turn to these, uh, instinctively almost turn to these ideas in challenging times? Now, of course, there are obvious things to say about that. The obvious reasons of anchoring our presence, the reassurance that we've overcome adversity before and we can do it again, the comforting belief that this is an interesting one, that somehow resilience is built into our national DNA and it, it only needs to be triggered and brought to life in difficult circumstances, a sense that it all somehow comes out good in the end. And as with all successful propaganda, these ideas gain traction because we want them to be true. Uh, there's a psychological benefit in hearing them and passing them on and in some case they correlate to the stories we like to tell ourselves about the past. There are other important characteristics uh, too and like 
all of the most pro powerful propaganda campaigns, the current use of cultural memories is a sort of heady mix of mobilization from above as part of a government or media narrative and enacted from below. And it's that combination that's proved so effective in the past. And there I'm reminded of the potent blending of state and popular British propaganda from the Second World War, or more innovative still, the Japanese propaganda campaigns of the Second World War that saw um, the public invited to construct their own propaganda campaigns while following the set uh, state master narrative of the war. And here, as with the remobilization of the propaganda of 1940 for now, the key messages no longer need to be constructed and guiding for above as they as they had been in 1940. They're now embedded, they're our natural place to go. And that allows those same messages to be spread widely and organically among the, compu uh, among the um, community, what the propaganda scholar Jacques Alol characterized as horizontal transmission as opposed to vertical uh, transmission. And it's, it's that that I really would like to get under and, and unpick and how that horizontal transmission work. The fact that it's not state sanctioned means that it, it tends to bypass the problem of vertical state sanctioned propaganda and that's skepticism. This isn't necessarily seen as propaganda at all. It's a shared collective narrative. Um, so in, in some ways, what we're seeing here is propaganda that's shed its propagandistic mantle, it's broken free from that label. And in doing that, it, it has a certain potency. I would really like to get underneath that process. And interesting, more interesting still is that we transmit that propaganda willingly because to do that fulfills a certain psychological need in us needs that become more pronounced and are sharpened at times of crisis, that need to feel comfort, companionship, solidarity, belonging and hope. And um, that, that is uh, at the centre of some of the work that, that David and I do together on, on rumour. It works in quite a sim similar way. Now, a cynic uh, might conclude that such narratives might also serve as a useful distraction from political failure, that warm, nostalgic glow of class glories may make us less alert to the, in the current circumstances, absence of testing or absence of PPE or inaction at critical moments. It's a kind of seductive, organic propaganda used so beautifully during the Dunkirk evacuation of May to June 1940 to give us what we ultimately want at times of despair, that everything will be all right, that setbacks can and have led to victory, that our spirit will carry us through despite the lack of resource planning capacity, etc. And we might also pause on the political implications as to what's missing from the reappearance of wartime propaganda now. Of course, a good deal of the propaganda of the war years drew on the trans-European collaboration to rid the world of fascism, specifically Nazism. And many stories of cross-European connections, the, fam the famous ones being Polish airmen, French resistors, or they all disappear here. The war here is reimagined as a uniquely British story devoid of international, especially European context. Um, perhaps any alternative to that narrative is not a comfortable story for our post-Brexit present and future. And the backdrop of empire is also absent now, but present then, too complex perhaps to fit into a singular cultural memory mobilized for a very specific purpose. But what I'm really wondering is how much longer that cultural narrative is able to persist and what we might draw from making international comparisons. We see similar things elsewhere in the United States, the Second World War imagined as the Good War, in Russia, the Great Patriotic War. Again, both starting life as concerted propaganda campaigns constructed for a specific historical moment, but both with enduring afterlives. So the ultimate question for me is whether the afterlife is in fact more important for historians to study than the original campaigns, more potent in fact as propaganda than those original campaigns and what then that means for the study of propaganda. And, pro and I have been absolutely guilty of this, but propaganda historians have always, and for absolutely understandable reasons, focused intently 
on the immediate effects of particular campaigns. But have we taken our eye off the ball by failing to fully investigate that the real effects of propaganda may be felt many, many years later, reawakened for new historical moments, deepening and prolonging the effects in unexpected and unpredictable ways? Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed um, for inviting me. It's a, a huge pleasure to be here. Um, uh, and I only wish we could have met, or well, actually met, um, under, under different circumstances. Uh, it sounds like the, the conference um, has been uh, an absolute triumph. Um, I also am going to attempt to share my screen. Uh, let's see if that works. OK. Mm -hmm. You should hopefully be able to see my uh, presentation. Someone shout at me if that's not working. So as you can see from my uh, keep calm and carry on uh, uh, poster here, um, some of this uh, links on very nicely with, with what uh, Joe has said in a really fascinating uh, presentation. But um, I think I'm looking at some slightly different things. Um, I thought today I'd talk about one of um one national myth that i think has had quite an airing during the covid crisis and it is one that, that uh, joe has alluded to uh, already um it's the idea that english people are inherently sensible moderate law-abiding public-spirited and pragmatic um i think we can see this in of course uh, the almost ubiquitous keep calm and carry on posters and mugs, uh, and uh, as Joe has already um, discussed, uh, the evocation of the alleged universal and indestructible stoicism of the Dunkirk and Blitz spirits, um, particularly during the, the recent uh, V Day uh, celebrations. Imperturbability, quiet good humour, keeping our heads while uh, others are losing theirs. According to this view, this is the sort of thing that English people are good at. Of course, um, other recent events have complicated this uh, picturesque scene. More on that later. The idea that uh, English people are sensible and moderate goes back uh, a long way. You can, of course, uh, find many expressions of this view uh, during the Blitz. Um, according to George Orwell in his essay, The Lion and the Unicorn, the English people, if not the intelligentsia, were quietly patriotic, but not nationalistic, instinctively hostile to the extreme ideologies of left and right, inherently gentle, rational, and reflexively committed to individual liberty and the rule of law. More recent attempts to define uh, Englishness um, have said much the same thing. According to Jeremy Paxman, tolerance and common sense are among the most uh, salient and praiseworthy components of English culture. So too Kate Fox's cultural anthropology of the English, which says much the same thing, um, if in a slightly more exasperated tone. Moderation is a deep-seated, um, unconscious default mode an avoidance of extremes, an excess, an intensity of any kind. This idea of pragmatism, uh, instinctive hostility and aversion to enthusiasm um, and um, ideological extremism uh, of any kind. Um, and of course, all of this, sorry, there aren't too many quotes here, uh, but this is another one from Jeremy Paxman, all of this is underpinned by a particular view of English history. Uh, and I think it is English history more than British history, which is, is probably significant. So according to Jeremy Paxman, again, 
uh, even English medieval popular rebellions were boringly civilized. He's talking here um, about the Peasants' Revolt, which he thinks is a very civilized affair by comparison with bloodletting on the continent. Uh, he's talking here, of course, um, about the Peasants' Revolt, a rebellion uh, where peasants successfully stormed the Tower of London and cut off the Archbishop of Canterbury's head, among other things. But uh, much less bloodthirsty than, uh, than elsewhere. So this moderation, it is claimed in this um, you know, particular kind of view of, of uh, English history, continues during the Reformation. England, according to this view, uh, followed a distinctive middle way between the extremism, uh, extremism of Rome on the one hand and Geneva on the other. The English people stoically, but essentially passively, put up with the religious reforms that were imposed on them from above. And aside from a few executions here and there, it was a pretty tame affair compared to what happened uh, on the continent. This view continues with the idea that the revolution of 1688 was a sensible, non-violent revolution. Uh, this is a, a, a view, uh, interestingly, undiplomatically expressed uh, by Margaret Thatcher during the 200 year anniversary celebrations um, of the fall of the Bastille in, in France. Um, it's a view that of course goes right back to Edmund Burke and his reflections on the revolution in France, which contrasted the violent French revolution with the supposedly conservative uh, English one. And ac so according to this view, which uh, I suspect is still actually rather influential in popular history and in public consciousness, although of course not in academia, English history is basically evolutionary, not revolutionary. So the this moderate, sensible English character um, is formed by and can be seen in uh, English history. Of course, um, revisionist historians have pretty comprehensively debunked all aspects of, uh, of this view. Um, to take a few random examples, Peter Marshall has recently reminded us um, in his history of the English Reformation that the Reformation was pretty bloody, involving serious popular rebellions pretty much every decade uh, right through to the 1570s. Ethan Shagan has shown that moderation in the Henrician Reformation uh, often meant bloody suppression of both sides. Uh, on one occasion in 1540, Henry burned six heretics while simultaneously having six papist priests executed for treason, just to show how uh, even-handed he was. Tim Harris, Stephen Pincus and others have argued that the Glorious Revolution looks pretty violent in a British perspective, and that each side uh, was in fact offering competing radical visions of the future. And we could go on and on really. Um, you know, really for much of the early modern period, politics was of course not moderate and sensible, but dominated by plots and conspiracy theories, uh, mis- and disinformation, and conspiracy theories both uh, conspiracy is both real and imagined. Um, you know, we can go from the anti-Catholic conspiracy theories of William Tyndall to the uh, rumours about the murder of King James I, recently explored um, in a, a book by Tom Cogswell and Alastair Bellany, to the popish plots of the 1640s and 1670s, the warming pan scandal of 1688-9, and so on. And the idea that the people as a whole are moderate and rational, of course, also runs uh, completely counter to a very important but not uncontested strand of elite rhetoric going right back to ancient Greece. And that uh, was that the people are the vulgar, ignorant multitude, uh, fickle, irrational, and potentially rebellious, and certainly not 
commonsensical, uh, sensible, and moderate. So the, this idea of the inherent moderation, tolerance, and sensibleness of English people and political culture has to some extent been shaken um, by recent events. The rumours and conspiracy theories about the coronavirus, which have led to the burning of 5G masts, uh, the Black Lives Matter protests, the rise of populist politics, and uh, dare I say it, Brexit. I do dare say it, because Joe has already said it. Um, but even there, I think the operating assumption tends to be that we had a basically consensual and uh, moderate political culture until quite recently. Um, but things have gone astray as a result of the, the breakdown of, a, of that sort of post-war consensus, um, the growing divide um, politically between left and right, um, which is pretty well attested in, in American politics in opinion polls when you ask people would you marry a Republican, Democrats are much less likely to say yes to that than they, they once were and vice versa. Um, and that polarization, which which also you know does have um, has crossed the pond, I think to to some extent, although it, it doesn't really map onto political parties um, in in the same way. You know, if, if anything, our allegiance to political parties, um, as opposed to our position on things like Brexit, is is actually uh, weakening. It seems to be, but that does seem to have. So the argument goes. Uh, led to a situation where there is little agreement over basic facts, let alone interpretations. Um, another issue, of course, is, is the internet, uh, with its polarising filter bubbles, which exacerbate this kind of balkanisation of our politics, destroys the uh, business model of our national meeting places uh, of yore, uh, like television and newspapers, around which we once, uh, it was said, gathered, replacing our, our media with a, a kind of unmediated Wild West where you can go online and find facts to support your conspiracy theory of choice. And of course, there is the uh, malign uh, influence of foreign governments and their campaigns of disinformation. Uh, which have provided a plausible but, but perhaps too convenient explanation for everything from the election of Trump to Brexit. And this has, has led journalists um, and scholars to claim that we are living in a post-truth news culture which seems in some ways quite familiar to uh, us early modernists, I think. So um, how new is all of this, really? How, how new is, is fake news and our polarised and apparently increasingly extremist political culture? Um, well, as, as Zhou Enlai nearly said of the impact of the French Revolution, it might be too early to say. Um, others here are much better placed than me to say how sane and consensual the era of post-war political consensus really was. Uh, but it does seem to me that it contained plenty of protests, strikes, terrorism, communist witch hunts, uh, conspiracy theories, and Soviet uh, disinformation. So in conclusion, um, and I, I, must, uh, I must stress that these are uh, invitations to discussion um, and half-formed thoughts pulled from thin air, um, or uh, maybe somewhere less savoury than that. Um, I, in fact, I've weaseled my way out of um, any firm conclusion here by putting question marks at the end of the following statements. Um, but I think that um, if we're taking the longer view, perhaps the troubling polarisation and mis- and disinformation that seems to characterise our current political culture, which seems very at odds with the historical myth of English moderation and common sense um, is perhaps uh, not something that is new, um, arguably, so much as a reversion to the historical norm. 
although that isn't a particularly comforting thought. Uh, to finish on a more positive note, um, the idea, it just sort of struck me um, just before I, I uh, started the, the paper today, um, that the historical myth of um, English tolerance and sensibleness um, is perhaps one of the more benign historical uh, uh, national myths. And I can certainly think of, of worse ones that, that, uh, that we might foster and I'm sure probably do. Um, I think certainly if we were to be complacent, you know, how harmful is, is this particular national myth? I think is an interesting question. I think certainly if we were to be complacent about this supposed hostility to violent extremism in our political culture, we would risk simply taking it for granted and neglecting the ideas and institutions that, uh, help, that, that help to keep it going uh, to the extent that it exists at all. You know, if we were to say, don't worry too much about uh, right-wing populism, uh, 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 fake news, we're basically uh, a, a sensible country. So, you know, we, 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 everything will be okay. Um, that, that might be an issue. But national uh, myths like that uh, are perhaps a, a kind of necessary illusion uh, that helps bind people together. Uh, and I think it's interesting to, to question whether the lockdown would have been observed as assiduously as it has been without the evocation of the Blitz spirit um, and the idea that uh, English uh, people are somehow good at this sort of thing. So thank you very much. Um, fantastic. Uh, so if I'd like to just invite both Joe and David back, we've got them both. Um, and at this point, I um, have the great pleasure to say thank you to both of our speakers. Um, and also, I think I should probably thank uh, Naomi as well uh, for a fantastic introduction and for sort of teeing up today's session so nicely. Um, we are going to move now on to the discussion uh, side of things. And this is where I need to encourage all participants, um, if you've got questions, uh, please do put those in the chat bar uh, and I will invite people forward in order to, to try to sort of answer some of these. Um, and I can see already uh, that we're getting uh, a number of different questions here, as well as people saying uh, thank you for the fantastic talks. Um, I think both speakers actually, you also post questions for our audience. Um, and the two questions that really stood out, I think, from your papers, firstly, um, the idea of necessary illusions. So David, building on what you've just said, are these things necessary in order to sort of bind together uh, a community, uh, whether that be national, local or, or international even? Um, and then Joe, coming from your paper, the idea of how long these myths last. So uh, we are still talking about the Second World War, but uh, what happens when that slips beyond uh, our lived memories? And I think that could be something that the audience may want to think about as well. Um, we've lived through and uh, living through a pandemic. If that's not enough to shake these myths, uh, what might be? Um, are there sort of historical parallels that we can draw uh, from there? Um, but I think I will move straight on to, uh, to, to the questions. Um, and it looks as though we've got um, a couple which are sort of more focused on uh, what Joe said. So you've had the 15 minutes to prepare. So I'll, I'll start off with you uh, and then we can, uh, we can move forwards. Um, so, Let's start with um, with Grace's question, actually. Grace, I don't know if you want to say this, uh, sort of articulate this in person, or if you'd like me to, to do it. If you want to say it, please do pop your mic on and uh, video on now. If not, I'll do my best to encapsulate things. Uh, it looks like it's going to fall on me. Okay, so we're, we're talking then about uh, the links here between the, uh, the two world wars, um, and whether or not the Second World War was using uh, similar messages from the first. So to what extent were they going through the same process of invoking national myths? Yeah, you mean you mean looking at uh, whether the First World War used, uh, the Second World War used First World War. Yeah, it, it's really dominant, um, but in, in unpredictable ways, <laughs> really unpredictable ways. And I'm going to do a, a sort of two-way uh, comparison, if I may, because, you know, I, I don't want to spend too long on this, but um, in Britain, the legacy of First World War uh, propaganda was so toxic um, that they moved away from it. 
they, they said absolutely in no way, no way are we going to repeat the mistakes of First World War propaganda. They thought it, it's too uh, jingoistic, it's too um, explicit, it's too aggressive. We need something much more subtle that, that better befits a democracy. It was what we did, and, and certainly um, the, the post-war debates really brought this to the fore. There were claims of wholesale lying, deluding the population, um, goading them into war, using propaganda as an, as a, as an offensive weapon against one's own population to, do, to justify going into war. So they, they, they went in a, a different uh, direction, talking about how we construct a propaganda fit for democracy. In some ways that tethered them a little bit, uh, in the early years of the war, but of course it, it, it paid extraordinary dividends once you hit the mid-war period for Britain. Germany, opposite situation, that we need to, to um, learn from the British aggressive propaganda of the Second World, uh, of the First World War, and we want to adopt some of those aggressive techniques. We don't have to necessarily bother with truths. Uh, we are not going to be caught out. Um, and German approach to propaganda in the First World War um, was characterized and became all folded in with the stab in the back, um, stab in the back myth. So they went off on two, Germany and Britain went off on two completely different paths, very much conditioned by the First World War experiences of both of those countries. They never broke free from them. And the Se Second World War propaganda was very much set within that context and explicitly acknowledged as such. So one, one certainly built, built on the other in, in very different ways. So I put myself on mute, no, really showing how to do this. Um, we've got a number of questions coming in, some really fascinating ones actually. Um, we're, we're sticking with the Second World War, War theme at the moment, but David, I'm sure we'll be introducing you into this in a moment. Um, there's a couple of questions here which I think we can link. Um, so Tanel Garani and Max Jones, both asking about sort of the, the different ways in which uh, these messages are shaped <laughs> by uh, people who are kind of engaging with them, but also by the technology that's available. Um, so whether or not the uh, sort of the, the power that social media gives people to manipulate images has had an impact uh, on the way these are shaped, but then also age. And in some ways, actually, um, we could be really sort of stretching some of the analysis here, because on the one hand, people who are most adept at using social media, perhaps, are most likely to not connect to these Second World War images. Um, so I'm wondering, that might be something that both of you could comment on, because David, you also used some of that imagery within your presentation. Um, so let me try and articulate that as a question then. Um, do we see that these messages, particularly on the Second World War, continue to have a resonance with younger people? So those, I think uh, Max Jones asked for those in the under 25s category. And then to what extent is this a story about social media? Is it our ability to manipulate images, create memes? Is that what's allowing these things to retain their salience? I think that memes question is a really interesting one. That's what I've been collecting. And that, that's really intensified over this, this recent period, and you can really see it with COVID. The, the memes are everywhere. I've downloaded hundreds from social media in this period. And it, it's very difficult to know without some proper uh, precise uh, analysis exactly how this, how, who, who the groups are. But it, it seems to be broader. What I'm kind of interested in, and I, w I would like to know if anyone's seen any of this. I haven't seen any of it uh, directly, but is it on TikTok? Um, this, is, this is what I don't yet know. You can see it all over um, Facebook and you can see it all over, over um, Twitter, but I don't yet know whether it's translated across there. I'd love, I'd love to know uh, whether, whether that's the case. And it, it seems to be, it seems to carry. I don't know when that generational break will come, if it ever comes, and how we pass on those stories. Certainly in my case, I don't have any um, um, uh, first-hand understanding of the Second World War, but it was very much part of my childhood, all of those stories around the war. How far does that carry on? And part of my growing up and consciousness was very much framed by those stories. It's one of the reasons I became a historian. My nan and my mum used to tell these stories. but. It, that's part of our familiarity with it and of course it still far, forms an important part of the, um, the school curriculum. Now the question is does that fade? I would love to know that question um, because that helps me to answer how long is that propagandistic 
memory going to last. David, you want to come in on this as well? Um, yeah, I, well, I, I think something that you, you said about the, this idea of kind of moral panics um, and uh, younger people sort of um, made a, a, a random neuron fire, really, because I, I wonder whether, you know, a lot of this stuff, a lot of the anxiety about uh, fake news around coronavirus and, and, and so on um, fits more into that really fascinating history of, of kind of uh, moral panics. Um, the, the idea that um, people need to be kind of uh, protected from, from uh, uh, false information fits very much, in, I think, into what Joe was just saying about the, the, the fears and scepticism about the power of, of propaganda that developed after the, the First World War. You know, which was, you know, Joe knows much more about this than I do. But but um, I think after the First World War, one of the things that was that happened is that a lot of the propagandists who had um, produced this material went and worked in public relations, and they wrote all these books about how how fantastically powerful propaganda was, with the implication that um, ordinary people are are basically gullible, and you know, and that they're fragile little minds are, are susceptible to uh, manipulation um, and so I, you know, I think we see something similar in, in, in debates about uh, fake news and, and so on particularly about young people that there is this kind of moral panic this idea that uh, young digital natives which is an incredibly naff phrase uh, now but people do sometimes still use are particularly susceptible to this kind of stuff because they've never read a newspaper and so on and, and, and so you, there's a lot of very patronizing stuff uh, about which in 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 a funny way echoes one of the things i was saying earlier about this this uh historical trope with a very venerable history which is about the the ignorant multitude and and how gullible um, but also potentially dangerous they are yeah, can I just come back on that, Henry? Is that okay? Because it's a really important, it's a really important point that every single this is almost on repeat with this one, in that every new technology, every new advance brings a new propaganda fear. You saw it in the 20s. It's, it's almost exactly the same um, discussion around the, the explosion of mass media in the 20s and cinema and radio. And this prompted another panic about the gullible masses. And, you know, such that you see all these odd uh, organizations springing up all over the place. And the one that um, springs to mind is a, an organization set up in the mid 30s in 30, 1937 in um, America called the Institute of Propaganda Analysis. Very strange um, organization. And they set themselves up as a means of combating propaganda. So what we're going to do is we're going to get hold of propaganda. We're going to deconstruct it. We're going to understand it. And then we're going to teach everyone how, how it works. And this will be this ultimate shield effect to the excesses of mass media. So they, they got it down to these sort of seven principles and they provide, they, they distilled it down onto a little card that you could slot into your wallet. And then if you suddenly came across a piece of propaganda, you could whip out <laughs> your defense card and um, identify the technique being used against you and then shield yourself and combat yourself. And it's interesting that there's a lot of, um, one of the, also the sort of parallels come back um, time and time again between sort of, viruses and propaganda and, and the, the work that David and I do together on, on rumour that, that all of these things are, are viruses that you can be inoculated against, protected against, there's a vaccine, you know, they talk about hypodermic needles, all of that language is there. We, we've got all that language back again. I mean, look up um, inoculation theory and fake news. It's back. Um, but of course, this is something that they that, that was all experimented throughout the 30s, 20s, 30s and 40s. And we, it's very cyclical. Um, the difference though here is um, scale and speed and scope. Um, we were not dealing with anything close to what you see at, on social media. And, you know, I, I, I do, I'm beginning to think that this is at times of um, polarization and, and, and political instability, this can be pretty dangerous. Yeah. And uh, you can see how it fractures on a mass scale 
I don't think we've seen anything quite with that power yet, despite the fears. Thank you. I, I agree, just really, it's a fascinating point. David, did you want to? Sorry, yeah, no, I, I agree, just uh, just really quickly coming back on that. It's something that I kind of go back and forth on because, you know, you, you see uh, modern examples of fake news in, uh, um, and Joe and I are very adept at going back into the past and saying, oh, hang on, that's happened before. But just, you know, just because you can find an example of something happening, it doesn't mean that we're seeing exactly the same phenomena. I think there is a, a quantitative and quite possibly qualitative difference. Yeah. And, and what's interesting, I think, is not the bots. <laughs> I, you know, I don't worry so much about, about the bots. I worry about people um, because the, the bots, you know, they, they give you some sort of scale um, and they give you fast duplication. But there's been a number of studies uh, lately saying it's not the bots that the problem is us. We're the ones and we're putting out the more convincing stuff because it's, it's coming out as, you know, as feeling much more real than the stuff that the bots can produce. The bots are getting better. And the deep fakes are deeply troubling, <laughs> but you know uh, that it's it, we have to take some responsibility here. I think uh, you know, and and that that's the kind of historical lesson I draw that that we have to self-regulate if we're going to get this under control. And and it's not about you know dealing with with bots, and it's distracting us from from one of the key issues, which is self-regulation, in my view. I know that's yeah fantastic and i think certainly facebook i mean the, the 1920s and 30s they would have bought to that idea it would have it would have you know a huge difference in terms of the, the kind of qualitative reach of this stuff uh, and also this brings us really nicely onto a question from Brody waddle and i'm going to do my best to articulate this it is quite a long one and um, Brody's really picked up on the um the distinction between uh, official state-sanctioned propaganda and the more unofficial sort of grassroots uh, ideas. And he's wondering whether or not you see a distinction between the type of messages that are most salient in each category. So is it that the, uh, the sort of idea of moderation and common sense, that's more of a sort of popular grassroots trope as opposed to being something coming from the top down? Are you, are you seeing distinctions with the messages uh, depending on where it's starting life. Yeah. David, you... I think it's really difficult to distinguish between um, uh, propaganda that comes from a, a, above and, and below, you know, because, uh, once again, Joe knows much more about this than I do. I don't really know that much about propaganda, but um, but it, it seems to me that certainly um, early modern propaganda is not always produced from above. Um, it's produced spontaneously by people from below who are trying to, um, often trying to kind of seek favour above. But, but you know, th there's a sense in which um, even propaganda that is centrally produced um, is in, in some vague sense the product of its audience because propagandists have to uh, produce messages that they know are going to resonate with, with, with their audience. Um, so uh yeah i i think um it's really interesting because i don't really know where these moderation and common sense messages are, are kind of coming from i mean i i think it's it's got to be a little a, a mixture of both from above and, and below isn't it Jane? yeah I, I think that's a really good point it's one of the areas that i find absolutely fascinating this one because um and it came about for me when I started to look at the First World War, you know, why, why is it that everybody gets so hooked up on this idea that this propaganda is so powerful? What's really different about the First and Second World Wars and so on? And um, I started to look at atrocity propaganda, actually, where, where and how that was being um, produced in the First World War. And I noticed there was a really un distinct phenomenon that happened that had real potency. And that is that you got a whole bunch of kind of official reports and that were propagandistic in their own in their own right, but they had a very particular form. So you had things like the Bryce report and so on and, and the colour books and so that had very specific, almost legalistic um, text. What then happened? And that would be released into the public sphere almost as an official report. And then the newspapers would pick up parts of it, and then you'd get this kind of semi official semi-official text and then there was an almost unbelievable explosion of popular uh, manifestations of this where a whole 
bunch of people from different um, cultural spheres or authors, uh, artists, cartoonists, I mean, you, you name it, and I'll give you a real extraordinary example of, of some of this in a moment, that they all kind of drew out all different aspects of those official reports and animated them in a popular way. And it was that kind of intersection between almost grassroots, personal, individual or group interpretation of those official propaganda and the official propaganda coming from the source. It's the kind of collision. But there's no way that the state propaganda could have resonated in exactly the same way or really sort of planted the seed and got the seed to take root unless you had that explosion of, proper, of popular culture propaganda sort of from below. And it was almost instinctive that it, it, it was never controlled and it was the, la the, the lack of control that gave it the power. And it, it, it spread everywhere. And um, one of the most interesting uh, examples of this is the way it's spread into material culture as well with um, the, the most uh, extraordinary example I've seen of this is a, a, an iron stand. It's in the uh, First World War uh, Museum in Peron in France and it's an iron stand where the, the, the stand is the face of the Kaiser and as you did your ironing you would rest the iron on the Kaiser's face like literally scolding him every time you put the iron down. Um, and light uh, Christmas decorations and light bulbs and you know it, it exploded and it's it, it's that space in between um, that that is really interesting but it's also the government doesn't have to work quite so hard in yeah. <laughs> spreading that propaganda and it's coming from the people for the people and the Japanese campaigns were really interesting they understood this they held national competitions to design propaganda and generate propaganda and because it's coming from from the people for the people it hits home and and it I, I think there's a really interesting body of work to look at that process. We haven't got hold of that yet, and it, it's a really interesting one for me. Well, let's stick with this idea then of propaganda being a product of its audience and thinking about the people, because um, a couple of questions have related to this, uh, in particular one from Lucy Matthews-Jones, who wonders whether particularly with these national myths, is this very much an English story? So um, we, we're talking, I suppose, about uh, some British newspapers or things which at least pretend to have uh, that wider reach. But is this very much about an English or, or even a London focus in some of the cases, uh, as opposed to thinking about Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, uh, where there might be quite competing uh, narratives at play? I think so. I, I mean, I think part of the reason why, for instance, you know, going back to what I was saying about that idea that, say, the 1688-9 revolution was a a moderate moment um, was because an older generation of historians tended to look at it particularly kind of from an English perspective but then of course if you look at it in a, in a British perspective it doesn't really look all that non-violent or or, or non-radical um, so I, I, I think it is a, and I think it's it's part of that sort of generation's um, tendency to kind of take why the word British kind of really meaning England and things that happen elsewhere are kind of uh, are kind of noises off. Um, so yes, I, th I think that's that's right, perhaps. Um, and even even perhaps because just going back to the I started with the George Orwell quote. I think it's in the same article, uh, the same essay, or maybe the notes on nationalism. He talks about uh, stereotypes about foreigners. And it's amazing how often the word excitable comes up. That's, that's the stereotype in, uh, in the 1940s, is that French people are excitable. And, and, so, and I think so to the, the same extent are Scottish people and, uh, and you know, Irish people and, and, and so on and so forth. It's, it, I think my, my instinct is that um, that sort of imperturbability uh, is to quite a large extent uh, an English rather than British. Yeah, I, I think that, that I think that's right for um, uh, I think that's right for the period that I look at too. And uh, you can re if you really want to see this at work, um, have a look at some of the mass observation reports where they ask um, uh, the mass observers to uh, ask uh, about what Britain means to me. 
And they are fantastic, those reports, because they come back and say, well, that doesn't mean anything to me at all. <laughs> and um, what means something to me is Englishness. And then they launch into all of these, these um, the descriptions of the English countryside and tolerance and fair play. And they're all the things that are interestingly mobilised in, um, uh, in uh, government propaganda, sometimes hugely clumsily. Uh, if you think about the opening sequences to The Lion Has Wings, for example, there's this fantastic uh, sequence and the final sequence is incredible, incredibly funny in some ways, because uh, it's the first bash at, at articulating this pro uh, propagandistically and you've got Merle Oberon staring into the stars and saying, well, we, we love England because we're, it's fair play and justice and, and uh, uh, RAF partner's gone to sleep at this under the tree. <laughs> Um, but it, all of that, there was a real tension and Sonia Rose's book on, on um, the People's War obviously brings this out beautifully. All of those tensions there with um, Scotland, uh, Wales, you know, all of those tensions and how that propaganda, how that People's War propaganda rubbed up against it. That works too with regions, you know, London can take it. Why just London? You know, there, there's the blitz going on all over and it created real tension there. And that's why when earlier I referenced, you know, how we blend out those tensions that were very much present at the time in relation to those propaganda campaigns. There were tensions, for example, if you read the home intelligence reports over Dunkirk. You know, not everyone bought that story at the time. It's, it's in, in a sense, it's evocative now. And, and, but at the time, the home intelligence reports were, people were really worried about this. You know, what are they covering up? What are they hiding? What, where are the emissions? This is a defeat, isn't it? Why isn't anyone telling us this? It's that, you know, contemporary anxiety. But a lot of those tensions are eroded i think over time and sort of distilled down like a sort of you're building distilling down a source and you get the very essence of essence of that campaign but at the time the campaign was full of those tensions and that driven by pre-existing beliefs and that's also pre-existing beliefs about identities whether whether regional national local they're all at play then and so now, now it's lost a bit. Sticking with this idea of identity, um, a, a number of um, the audience have been asking about the, the other sort of markers of identity. So thinking here about status, class and gender. Um, and I'm going to sort of build on a question that was asked by Naomi. Um, sort of how do you think some of the things we've talked about today, this idea of uh, resilience, this idea of resolve and the idea also of moderation, uh, to what extent are they shaped uh, by existing ideas around status or gender? I love that question. It's a good um, one. Yeah, I love that question because it reminds me of um, uh, writing about um, the careless talk campaigns and, and how uh, people were responding at the time. What's fascinating, I think, that comes through the archive about the Second World War is every group thinks that they're the most resilient one. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody else is not resilient at all. So it doesn't matter what, and, and it's particularly true when you've got into, when it becomes intersectional. So working class women uh, for, for some groups in society are the most dangerous. These are the most people most likely to spread careless talk. Whereas working class women think upper class men are the most likely to spread careless talk. And you've got all of this interplay. Everyone believes that they are the most resilient uh, group of people. And it's sort of doubled when you get two identities colliding. I mean, that was with, without fail. <laughs> everyone pointed fingers at everyone else. Well, we don't have to worry about us, but it's them over there who we have to really worry about. And of course, it's everyone. Is, is everyone but those tension again you know it comes back to those tensions those tensions were really laid bare by a lot of this propaganda which those tensions gone gone in the way that we retell these stories perhaps they have to be gone because we're using them for a very specific purpose now but they're very present at, at the time i think that issue of identity uh, also goes back to one of the other questions which was about um, you know in light of black Lives matter. Is there a need for more inclusive national myths uh, if they are to remain kind of potent and enduring? I, I think this is really 
interesting. I, I think this is going to be a huge battleground um, over the next few years. Um, I don't know if anyone saw the, uh, there was a, a policy exchange, which is a, a kind of a think tank, and they've um, issued an announcement about, it's got, I think it's called History Matters, and it's, it's the, they're essentially kind of claiming to speak for a silent majority who want to conserve monuments and um, and who want to kind of celebrate our glorious national past and and so on and, and uh, I think sort of reading between the lines they're a little bit um, concerned about the the possibility that universities are um, just full of sort of uh, left wing loonies who are sort of teaching young people to be um, ashamed of, of their their history and, and they're kind of calling for um, reforms to the curriculum and, and so on, which I, which I think actually were, sort of happened a couple of years ago, something similar happened ago, uh, a couple of years ago under uh, Michael Gove. Um, and uh, I, don't, you know, I don't know exactly what to think about this because, I mean, I, I said that, that our, our national myths, our sense of a national path, uh, past are part of what kind of draws us together um, as a as a nation and i think if you look at the history of national of the idea of nationalism um the the idea of a national past often an in often a completely invented national past um has been very very important in kind of creating a, a sense of uh, of nationhood um but i you know it seems to me like um the people involved in this think tank are, are kind of worried about that uh that sense of togetherness and having a shared past that people could be proud of um, sort of falling apart um, which isn't actually very new um, I think um, about a decade ago that a historian in America brought out a book called um, who are we question mark which was a, a, a very kind of gloomy book saying you know essentially because our, our societies have become so diverse we no longer have a shared uh, national uh, history to, to kind of bind us together and to encourage us to uh, collective action. Um. I'm going to be one of those people that that group does not like very much <laughs> because um, I am an active campaigner for a change in a curriculum. Um, I, I think this is incredibly important and um, I guess it comes down to you know what is the past there for? It's not there to provide us with a comfortable narrative, actually. Um, and I find that the fact that, you know, that, that this, this is a debate as to whether that we should include a full um, and inclusive history in our schools, extraordinary. A confident democracy would embrace that and would want to know its full history its full past and come to terms with that if it can you know and, and at least see it at least you know at, what study it that i i just find it uh, um extraordinary that uh, we don't want to do that this with our curriculum i mean it, it is time it is way past time that our curriculum needs to reflect our our full past and also to 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 acknowledge that past i mean we have to do this um and we want to do it because that's how history should um that that's the role that history can play in in thinking about um who we are and who we want to be and and that's really important so i suspect i may be one of those people that they don't necessarily um um yeah, yeah, I think I'm going to be one of those people they don't necessarily want to be teaching in our university, <laughs> but I think I ought to be. <laughs> we've come on to this, I was, um, I'm going to give the game away now, I was keeping the Black Clothes uh, Matter question till last, because I thought it would be a fantastic one to end on. Yeah. And because of course, this is, uh, the, the panel is called National Myths in Times of Crisis, and although uh, the last three months have been dictated in many ways by our response to COVID-19, uh, that is far from the only crisis that we are currently grappling with. Yeah. Um, and if I may for a moment pop my Social History Society hat on, um, this is an issue that as a society we are also taking uh, incredibly seriously. 
uh, something that we have campaigned on for the last uh, few years. Uh, and I think it is a, a really, really important question. And, and it leads on to a slightly bigger one and something which is spurred um, by a distinction, I think, that was drawn in David's paper between uh, popular histories and public consciousness on the one hand and academic history on the other, something which we've just alluded to within this discussion. Um, and I think this is a chance perhaps for both of you to think, what can we do? So, uh, Joe, you might want to start us off because you said you are actively campaigning for this. Yeah. Um, yep. You have a captive audience. Uh, yeah, great, good. There's a, a campaign that, that we're, we're helping to promote at the moment at the IHR by the Runnymede Trust. Seven simple things you can do to get the curriculum changed. I think we have, we, it, there are so, there's so much to do. I mean, this is just one aspect of all of, all of this. And, but this is an important one. And to get that curriculum changed is, is really critical. Uh, and we need a full uh, curriculum that reflects our full history and to make sure that, that that includes black history, that that includes a full evaluation and frank evaluation of uh, colonialism. And I, that, need, that needs to happen. And I was really struck, you know, when I, when I took over this, this job now, that um, we had a, 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 the Aylmer seminar that we, we host with the National Archives and, and the Royal Historical Society on, on um, Black Archives. And the first presentation was really startling because there we were again um, talking about what we were going to do. And the presentation highlighted that we've been talking about this in the 60s, 70s, the 80s, the 90s and the 2000s. And guess what? We were sitting around a room talking about what shall we do? Well, look, We've got the RHS report. We have people, people, um, scholars around us to tell us what we have to do. We have organisations like the Runny Mead Trust to tell us what we need to do. Let's just do it. Let's just just take on those uh, recommendations and use whatever we've got to change something. Not to just talk about why why things matter and why we need to do this. Let's get it moving. And I think lobbying, that that campaign by Running Me Trust asks us all to lobby people who have the power to change a curriculum. That's one thing. We can do things locally. There are loads of examples in the RHS reports of what we can all do to change the diversity of uh, the historical profession. That we have to do. Those of us who are able to divert resources to, to promoting us to do it, do, let's do that. And let's do so, let's do something. And I, I feel really quite um, I re feel really quite passionate about about this. I don't want to talk really about that anymore. I want to take some action so that we can start to see a difference. I mean, the fact that then and that was two years ago uh, we had that discussion, and and we're back again. And and in a way, we're talking. I'd like to uh, do some actions and. Number one for me at the moment, because it's the campaign we're involved, let's get that curriculum changed. What's the problem? And it has to come with resources for teachers to, to retrain too. You can't just throw it all at the teachers and expect them to pick it up. Let's create some space here to, to allow us to change that curriculum and to embed it and get it done. Fantastic. And Joe, I'd encourage you to have a look on the chat as well, because I know there's a couple of comments come in about okay. that. Um, but David, do you want to, yeah. to comment? What, what, what just, to, just to endorse it, really, um, yeah, and to say that, that, that I totally agree and that a, uh, you know, a self-confident, curious culture um, can ask difficult questions uh, about its, its past and that it's not the job of historians, you know, obviously, to just kind of provide comforting uh, myths for, for people. And indeed that, uh, you know, a look at our national past, which looks at all aspects of it, um you know is not antithetical to having a history that kind of gives us some kind of sense of of national uh, identity and 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 coherence um although i'm not sure that that's something that historians should be trying <laughs> consciously to do um but I, the only thing I, i'd add i guess is is that you because you, you, you brought up the the um different distinction between kind of popular and, and academic uh, history i do think that in the academy there, there is still a bit of, despite the impact agenda, there's a bit of a, a looking down on popular history sometimes uh, and I think that is potentially dangerous. You know I think 
a, a lot of this um, this kind of attack on on the profession, if that's what it is, is kind of predicated on on the idea that that uh, academia is, has kind of split so really far apart from from kind of popular history and and, and ordinary people's kind of conceptions of, of history. Um, and if if academics don't write popular history, then someone else will, um, and the results might not be very good. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd also just like to add that that um, black history is our history. It is British history. I mean, David Olashoga's uh, work has, has made that, and others have made that abundantly clear. And uh, and so why why is it not there? Why is it not present? It, it is British history. Um, two passionate uh, responses, I think, to that question. And um, uh, David, I think also, um, one of the things that struck me uh, actually about your presentation today is the way that you were weaving things like Jeremy Paxman's work into this. So actually taking that popular history seriously and, and interrogating it as we would with any uh, sort of more academic text. Um, we are, I think, coming towards the end. We've got just around five minutes. I'm going to ask, I'm going to be really naughty and ask the final question. Um, and something that we have uh, been really keen to reflect on, I think, as a society, is the impact that current events have had uh, on the profession more widely. Um, mm -hmm. So as a final question to both speakers, um, I wonder in what ways uh, COVID has sort of impacted upon your work, um, but also not just the sort of, oh, the archives are closed, and I can't go and do anything. Has it changed the way that you're thinking about the past or your relationship with the past? Um, and I might start with David and end with Joe because I, I know the IHR have been doing a lot on this. Um, so David, if you would, like, wouldn't mind uh, having a stab at it. Uh, it just means I don't have any time to do any research. <laughs> I think that's 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 the main thing. I mean, I think you know it's um, it's certainly true that I see a lot of kind of uh, contemporary resonances with with things that I, I research you know the, the history of rumor the, the history of public opinion and that's a, a, a wonderful thing I, I don't set out to do this um, but it just seems like it, you know and, and I, I sometimes lament the fact that um, things that I'm interested in um, then somehow through some mysterious process um, have some horrible impact on the world and I, I suddenly become relevant maybe it would be better if I was if the work that I was doing was less uh, relevant to things that are uh, happening around than that now. That's about all I've got, I'm afraid. Yeah, I, I can echo that. I, you know, 20 years ago when I started working on propaganda, nobody cared, really, if I'm absolutely honest. And suddenly it's exploded. And of course, you don't, you don't want it that way. So obviously, you know, David and I have been collaborating on, you know, what, what we can do together in terms of tracking sort of COVID rumours and, and, you know, what, what our understanding of how that works can be deployed. I think for the profession more broadly, I'm, I'm going to say two things. I'm going to say something about the IHR, if I may, Henry, if that's okay, about you know how, how we're moving. And then I'd just like to end on a really important point, and it's one that really worries me. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that um, for the IHR, it's been a real eye-opener, actually, because we've all had to pivot online, like the Social History Society has has done too with this amazing conference. Um, do you know what? I think we can include so many more people in our seminars, our activities. You know, when you think about, you know, who can and can't come into London to our seminars and the reasons for that. Do we really want to go back to our old ways of working in future? Or, or does this, I mean, we do want to come together, of course, time to time, but could we be more inclusive than we have been? Could we be, you know, could we extend our work and discuss in, in different kinds of ways? And this has shown us, I think, this period that that's possible and it's desirable. The numbers we're getting are extraordinary and their numbers, especially importantly, giving platform to early career scholars. Now, here's the thing that concerns me because we, we went into this crisis as a profession and, and actually higher education more broadly with precarity as an absolutely critical issue. Now that has become worse. And this really is concerning. And I think we need to collectively as a profession step into this space because I'm really fearful for the next generation of historians. Um, they've had research period intensely disrupted. 
But not only that, opportunities are diminishing. They're being taken away because of the sort of financial impact of what is happening to higher education and the lack of adequate uh, underpinning and support uh, for, for what is an absolutely critical part of um, our national infrastructure. You know, the, the teaching opportunities that we probably all benefited from are being taken away. The opportunity for professional development are being taken away. You know, all the conferences and networking, all of those opportunities are being taken away. And what about the next steps if we're all, you know, closing down what we can spend? What are going to be the opportunities and where's our next generation of historians coming from? I'm, I am really bothered about that. And in, in September, um, I was just talking to History Lab yesterday, and we're going to be launching a, a career building program from in the first uh, term to, to make sure that, that we continue to support our, our next generation of scholars. I think this is this is a profound moment. I hope it isn't, and I hope that it kind of blends out and we find our feet again. And but but we were never there in, in before COVID. I just fear that this has made things an awful lot worse. And the second thing that that I want to keep an eye on is about the humanities, and you know that pivot towards science. Now I don't mean to sort of um, I don't want to. Um, make a pleading case about this, but rather a positive case about the humanities. There is so much that the humanities can do at, at times like this, and we're seeing it. Where are we all turning to for solace? Where are real solutions to global problems coming from? They're coming from interdisciplinary collaborations, uh, and they're coming from, they are coming from the humanities. Humanities are part of the solution. They are not part of the problem. And there is a broader narrative that that is circulating, that is deeply problematic. Um, and we want to see that the benefit of the humanities and history in, in its entirety, not just sort of for economic gain and purpose, although it has that too, and it can help solve problems, but because it teaches us who we are as human beings, because it's, it's, a, a, it's fundamental to understanding the process of being human, we lose that, and we are in extreme trouble as, as a civilization. So, and I think COVID has kind of sharpened this a little bit for some reason. I hope it's temporary, but I don't think it is. Anyway, I do think that there are several uh, things that this has brought into sharper focus. And, and I'm concerned, but I also think that we need to pull together. This is the point which we pull together to, to, to deal with it. A nice positive note then to end on, um, but obviously, you know, the, this is uh, a really important <laughs> times, hence why we are not in Lancaster and why we are um, sort of holding a conference in this format. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to say thank you once again, uh, Professor Joe Fox and Dr. David Coast, and um, thank you for taking the sort of keynote responsibilities uh, at the end of a very busy couple of weeks. Thank you to the audience. Uh, many of you, I recognise the names, you've been in other sessions, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, certainly from the society's perspective, um, it's been an experiment, but one that I think we have learnt a huge amount from uh, and one that I'm sure we will be very keen to repeat. Um, that's it, it's all over. The recordings will be available in a couple of weeks, um, but thank you once again. Uh, and yes, Joe and David, a particular thanks to you both. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really thank you for all the excellent questions. Thank you.